Hello, I'm Patrick Ryan from Tennessee World Affairs Council and welcome to Impact Japanese Business Investment in Tennessee, the special project of the Japan America Society of Tennessee. Today, we're talking with Celeste Wilson, who's the Senior Director for uh, Donor Engagement at the United Way of Tennessee. Uh, she has a background in Japanese business uh, relations in the United States. And we are pleased to talk with you today, Celeste, uh, about your background and insights and perspectives on uh, the impact of uh, that commercial relationship. So welcome, Celeste, and thanks for your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Pat. It's an honor to be a part of this illustrious series. Of course, I know Japan America Society of Tennessee well. I once served on the board, and I strongly believe in the work of JAST and how strongly JAST is working to bring Japanese businesses in Tennessee and Tennessee businesses together. So again, thank you so much for having me here today. Oh, uh, you're welcome, Celeste, and, and we're honored to, to have you as part of uh, this, this project. Let's start with uh, a little bit of your background. Uh, tell us uh, how you got interested in uh, international business, what, uh, what your experience has been, uh, uh, especially dealing with uh, Japanese companies and, and your leadership role and, and what you've learned about uh, the Japanese investment uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, we'll get to uh, the impact here in Tennessee. Sure, that's a, that's a lofty question, I'll do my best. But I actually first became involved with Japanese culture and society and business when I was 18 years old. I applied for an exchange student program and ended up in Japan, living with a Japanese family for a year. It was a gap year for me, so I took a year off between high school and college and in those days, that was highly unusual, but obviously very worth it for me. I'm still in very close touch with the family with whom I lived in Japan. And obviously that year had such an impact on me that when I came back to Duke, I majored in Japanese studies and then moved to DC where I worked for a law firm that represented Japanese clients, including Toyota at, or Toyota at about the same time, Governor Alexander was working with the Japanese to come to Tennessee. I worked for the law firm and wrote memos to the Japanese clients, especially the car manufacturers about the importance of opening factories in the United States because this was right in the middle of the trade war of the mid seventies. So it was a mess. I loved it, but I, made the decision after several years at the law firm that I did not want to be a lawyer. So I ended up at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in DC and got my master's in international relations with a focus on Japanese studies. To graduate from SICE, one must be fluent in the language one selects. And of course, when I was in Japan, I learned to speak Japanese because I was immersed in the language and I con continued with my study of Japanese through graduate school and even to this day, I'm still studying Japanese, but it was a wonderful experience for me and I ended up working for the Dean of Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, whose name was Dean George Packard. George had actually worked for for Reichauer, Ambassador Reichauer, when he was the ambassador under President Kennedy. And George himself had lived in Japan in the 50s. He was very dedicated as well to enhancing Japanese studies at SICE, School of Advanced International Studies. So he hired me to come on board and together we built the Reichauer Center for Japanese Studies at Johns Hopkins. What that meant was planning programming with Japanese leaders in the area, with senators, with congressmen, and also traveling back and forth to Japan to raise money from Japanese businessmen. And it was mostly businessmen in that in that day. Um, it was actually a kind well, of certain, certainly Ambassador Reichar. Th those those were very formative uh, years in in the U.S. Japanese relationship. So that that must have been uh, quite an insightful experience. Uh, uh, building that uh, legacy at SICE. It was wonderful. I did not work with Ambassador Reichauer, but I did work right. with George who absolutely admired him 
as you can imagine, and all that he was able to do to continue the relationship between United States and Japan. He was ambassador in the early 60s. And if you think about it, that was 15 years after the war was over. So that's why his role was so important. And to me, it's fascinating that we now have had two Japanese ambassadors to Japan from Tennessee. So I feel very fortunate to almost be in the right place at the right time when it comes to our Japanese ambassador or our ambassadors to Japan. But in any case, that was a great experience. And I think the highlight was when we at Johns Hopkins conveyed upon the prime minister at the time, Nakasone, an honorary degree from SAIS. So we went over to Japan and with great majesty at the Plaza Hotel, sorry, at the at the um, Hotel Okura, conveyed an honorary degree upon the, the prime minister. And that was, needless to say, a lot of fun and lots of stories went along with that project. I ended up moving to Dallas, Texas from DC in the mid eighties because my um, husband at the time had secured a job in, in Dallas. And I thought, what will I ever do in Dallas that relates to the Japanese business community? Well, as we all know, connections are very helpful. And I met someone who introduced me to someone who introduced me to a wonderful Japanese businessman whose name was Iwasa Kaizo-san. And Iwasa-san's father was actually the chair of the board of the Fuyo Group, the Fuji Bank Group. And so, Iwasa-san hired me to be the, the, the United States representative of his company. He was based in Tokyo, I was based in Dallas, and we worked on mergers and acquisitions between mostly Fuyo Group businesses, but also businesses in Dallas. And these were small to mid-sized companies. One of our businesses, in fact, was one of the early developers of a drug for AIDS and was looking for a partner in Japan. And we found a pharmaceutical company to connect the two of them. Another was involved, for instance, in, um, how shall I put it, photography and online video, even though online wasn't a word in those days. But he was con we connected him with a photography company in Japan. And they developed some, I guess in those days, the word wasn't software, but something along those lines to enhance cameras and photography. So I had a great time doing that, but the, the thing is I only lived in Dallas for about a year. I then moved to Nashville because again, we were transferred to Nashville. And so that was in 1987 and I've been here ever since. Fortunately, when I moved to Tennessee, one of the very first people I met was Ed Nelson. And I know when I mention Ed's name, almost everyone who's watching this video is going to smile because Ed was beloved. Ed was the honorary consul general to Japan from Nashville. And he was delightful and immersed in everything Jap Japan related here in Tennessee. So he and I worked together on some projects and really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know him and he got to know Iwasa-san and they came to visit. And so as, as anyone will know, Gregarious Ed and Gregarious Iwasa-san became fast friends. That's not hard to understand. In other words, I was able to transfer the work I was doing with Iwasa-san in Tokyo to Nashville as well, while continuing to commute to Dallas. So for about 10 years, I commuted from Nashville to Dallas and visited Tokyo quite a bit, of course, to meet with Iwasa-san and their clients. And, and, and those were days when uh, we didn't have a consul general in Nashville as we do now. So I'm sure the role of the, the honorary consul uh, was more outsized than, than it would be today. That's exactly right. In fact, it was Ed who pushed the idea of bringing the consul general from New Orleans to Tennessee due to the fact that there was so much business in Tennessee sure. and a, a Nashville location would be central for the ambassador. The hurricane hit and that was delayed a little bit, but 
Sato-san was our first ambassador or first consul general in Tennessee for um, Japan. And Ed is the one who found the beautiful house where the consul general lives now. So Ed, I wouldn't say begrudgingly, I would say with delight and happiness because the consul general chose Nashville, turned the reins over to the to the consul general. And of course, we've had a string of amazing consul generals ever since. To be sure. Okay, so um, you've, you've been immersed in this Japanese experience from uh, the end of your high school days and, until uh, up till now. And uh, you, you have an appreciation for the, uh, the scope and depth of Japanese foreign direct investment in the United States more broadly. Uh, and you understand uh, the particulars of the investment here. Uh, the automotive industry uh, initially was uh, a large footprint in, in some of the communities, Middle Tennessee and so forth. But it's expanded around the state uh, in terms of the automotive sector suppliers and so forth. But it's increased in the number of sectors that are represented. You know, we have companies like NTT Data here now and, right. and others um, that have uh, given Tennessee really uh, uh, some inroads in, into uh, being a leading uh, state in, in the United States among foreign direct investment, especially from Japan. Uh, to give us your insights and perspectives on, on what that means to Tennessee to be such a recipient of uh, all these businesses and business interests and, and uh, the prosperity that, that comes along with that. Well, truthfully, I think it all goes back to Senator Alexander, who was pres sufficiently prescient to recognize that the topography in Tennessee would be absolutely appealing to Japanese businesses. The location is central throughout the United States, as we well know. And Tennessee is a friendly state. Tennesseans generally are welcoming and open to new newcomers. And I'm hoping and thinking that Japanese business people here recognize that they were welcome and are welcome and will always be welcome in Nashville and throughout Tennessee. I can add a little bit of a different perspective as well because I work at United Way. I have found that Japanese businesses in the area are very generous businesses to our community. Bridgestone, as we well know, I think Chris Karboriak is one of the interviewees, can talk a lot about what Bridgestone has done in the community. Sure. And I will also say that um, this is a salute to the current CEO of Bridgestone. Bridgestone had the largest United Way campaign this year, raising over $2 million for United Way of Greater Nashville. And that, to me, is an indication of the culture recognizing the importance of a strong community. Nissan has also been a very strong partner of United Way. So we're very fortunate that Japanese businesses understand that the community is a community for all of us. And we are so lucky to have leaders that are committed to the community and that is Japanese as well as the American leaders at the Japanese companies. Well, in, in all of our interviews, we've been hearing about the involvement of, of Japanese businesses across Tennessee that get involved in communities. Uh, for example, uh, the CalSonic Arena where the Tennessee Walking Horse right. uh, exhibition is held uh, was provided by the CalSonic company. Uh, we see in and around uh, Nashville, the, the names of Japanese businesses on, on this or that uh, public uh, structure. So. Um, uh, I appreciate your mentioning the philanthrop uh, philanthrop philanthropic uh, efforts of Japanese businesses in, in the community. It, it adds uh, more to uh, the understanding of what the impact of, of the businesses are. Um, you know, we, we also look at uh, uh, the economic and community development aspect of this, and, and I'm sure you're aware of the, uh, the impact uh, maybe not the, uh, the specific numbers, but in terms of the prosperity that uh, is brought to uh, Tennesseans uh, through jobs and uh, community development in places from Maryville to, uh, to Memphis right. and up and down uh, from Kentucky to the Alabama lines. Uh, and any perspectives or 
uh, your your experience uh, in business that you can help us understand how how some of that uh, expansion benefits the uh, uh, the people of Tennessee. Well, I think that the people of Tennessee can always benefit from the diversity of the population. And especially when companies like Bridgestone and Nissan are choosing to make their headquarters in Nashville, we're finding, as you can attest, other US organizations making a decision to move here as well. And I think that impact is, is a profound one in terms of jobs, the workplace, the workforce, and what we all can learn. Another kind of fun impact of all of this has been wonderful Japanese restaurants and Japanese grocery stores. And we can't forget the cultural aspects of all of this as well. Um, we have also um, a sister city in Japan, which I think is very important. Kamakura is our sister city. And for those of you who don't know, Sister Cities is a national organization. And Nashville has a sister cities organization. We have nine sister cities throughout the world. And one of them is in Kamakura, Japan. What's interesting about that is I mentioned Consul General Sato, who was our first Consul General. Um, he was, of course, beloved as well. When he came to Nashville, he had three goals, and he, someone else might have referenced this during the interviews, but he wanted to start a cherry blossom festival, and we now know that our cherry blossom festival is the largest festival of its, of its kind in the southeast, and we cannot wait until April 10th when we resume the cherry blossom festival. Second, he wanted to establish a sister city relationship with a Japanese city, and he just happened to suggest Kamakura because it was his birthplace. And so we now have a formal relationship with, with Kamakura. Carl Dean, Mayor Dean, went over to sign the agreement, and we had a great delegation, including Ralph Schultz and Chris and others from the Tennessee business community. Um, attending that ceremony. It was lots of fun. And back to Consul General Sato, the third thing he wanted to do was learn to play country music. And he learned to play the guitar. And I imagine a lot of you listening to this interview will remember the times when we would go down into the basement and he would play and Mari would play. And it was just so much fun because he had a ball playing American and Japanese songs on his guitar for the entire community. So again, there's, I believe, just a warmth among Japanese and Nashvilleans and Japanese and others from around the, the state. Um, there's a great feeling of warmth between the two peoples that expands beyond just business, but also into the cultural arena as well. We're very fortunate. Well, you talk about the uh, Consul General Sato and, and uh, the Cherry Blossom Festival. He also brought the gift of the trees to uh, right. Nashville. And was, uh, mm -hmm. we, we can appreciate that every every time, especially in the spring when the trees are in blossom. But uh, I, I think uh, we may not be pushing Washington out of the way, Washington, yeah. D.C., uh, in terms of the festival, but we certainly have uh, a, a fantastic showing of, of the, the trees and, and the festival downtown at, at uh, at Public Square, and, and uh, I, I, along with you, are, uh, am looking forward to to that. We also uh, should emphasize the fact that Sister Cities, uh, this isn't just uh, um, you know some tacit arrangement between cities and and mayors go over and shake hands and that kind of thing, but this this program uh, includes youth exchanges, uh, cultural uh, awareness for for young people and and older people. Um, but uh, there's a lot of emphasis on youth exchanges. I know uh, there are uh, Americans who go to Japan as, as a result of this and learn Japanese culture and uh, they, they see the sites. And uh, of course, the iconic Daibutsu, uh, the Buddha in, in Kamakura um, is, uh, is, is a central uh, theme to the relationship. But uh, there, there's a lot there in the sister cities relationship. And I understand that you are a proud board member of Sister Cities, 
and uh, we we salute the work uh, that goes on there. And uh, uh, I think that uh, Nashville gets a lot out of that relationship. And I, I will mention that in all the interviews we do, and and you touched on this, a key word that keeps popping up in everyone's lips is the word relationship. This isn't just a a, a group of business people who have come to Tennessee to uh, build some factories because this or that economic advantage, but the the um, the relationships that were fostered, as you correctly point out, starting with uh, Governor Alexander at the time, uh, now Senator retired Alexander, but uh, uh, all roads seem to lead to Lamar Alexander and talking about building the relationship and how that is carried down with everyone we've spoken with as part of this project. Uh, the relationships have been the key and uh, it's been reciprocated on both sides. Well, I think that's true. And I often hearken back to something Mike Mansfield said. Mike, Senator Mansfield was another wonderful ambassador to Japan. And he is often quoted as saying the U.S.-Japanese relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none. And I'm, of course, a little bit partial, but I know other relationships are as important. But I think that we are just so fortunate to have the strong sense of community, the strong commitment by Japanese companies, the strong commitment by our state and city toward making the Japanese feel at home in Tennessee, whether it's Nashville or Memphis or Chattanooga or Maryville. We are so pleased and happy that the investment continues to grow. And I think that anyone you talk to who knows about Japanese investment in Tennessee recognizes that it took a lot of people to make that happen. And I can't possibly name them all, but I think you're going to probably be interviewing all of them. So well, we, we I salute hope to reach, them. <laughs> reach as many, many as possible. And uh, we'll, we continue to add names. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk uh, offline about uh, who uh, in, in your, uh, in, in your arena might uh, fit uh, the bill to talk with us about this project. Uh, Celeste, any, any final comments you have on, on what uh, Japanese business uh, and the relationship, the commercial relationship has, has meant to Tennessee, to the United States, uh, to Americans um, across the board? Sure, I think it, the relationship, again, helps, helps reduce barriers. It helps increase understanding. It helps grow relationships. And one final plea I would have is a nonstop flight from Nashville to Tokyo. <laughs> there are, there are uh, rumors that that's always around the corner and uh, knock on wood, once we get out of this uh, pandemic uh, mess, uh, I think travel will, will become much more uh, a topic of interest and, and progress. And with the, uh, uh, the brilliant new airport that is, uh, being built uh, around what uh, BNA has been uh, uh, harkens to a, a day where international is clearly uh, an, an afterthought. It's, it's bec will become redundant in, uh, in understanding what's going on at the airport out there. Yep. And well, Pat, again, one last, one last note. Thank you for organizing this and thank you for the World Affairs Council because you too are playing a role on a daily basis with fascinating interviews and inclusiveness and in bringing people together, not just from Japan, but from all over the world. So thank you for your leadership. Well, thanks for your kind words, Celeste. I appreciate that. And thanks again for your time today and sharing your uh, perspectives on this important topic, uh, the impact of Japanese business investment in Japan. Uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, please uh, check the uh, JAST uh, YouTube channel for more of these interviews in the series Impact Japanese Business Investment in Tennessee. You can find an index that will uh, lead you to all the videos and transcripts of all the interviews on the uh, website of the Tennessee World Affairs Council, and that is tnwac.org slash J-A-S-T. And uh, there's a wealth of uh, important information there for you to help understand the importance of uh, what uh, people like uh, Governor Alexander, Governor Sundquist, uh, all the other governors, the people from the economic and community development arena, uh, the public sector, the private sector, public, uh, uh, the average citizens, 
people in the communities have done to ensure that uh, Tennessee has benefited from this relationship. So that's it again, Celeste, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible sooner rather than later. Exactly. Thank you all. Everybody have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.